It's like flying a giant candy cane. Woo! -hoo! Candy cane plane! Candy cane plane! Hello everybody, I'm Dare Tevers. Welcome aboard! Welcome to Dresden, Germany. I chose this because, well, because I knew it was a runway. That's pretty much how that worked. Welcome aboard our Albatross D3 model. Not much here. One thing to note, if I were to turn my throttle all the way down to zero, it actually will cut the engine. So, you can't actually turn the throttle all the way off. Very important for flying. I should probably try to remember that. It is an interesting Candy King Striper plane. Now, you'll notice how it's cutting the scenery out. The prop is cutting the scenery out. That is a difference in how FSX Service Pack 2 and Steam Edition handle propellers versus the pre-Steam Edition Service Pack 2. This is a pretty constant problem. It kind of cuts the scenery out like that. It's, yeah, you just have to place a new propeller texture in there. I didn't do it because... I don't remember the reason. Let's power up our Mercedes D3A inline water-cooled engine. 170 whole horsepowers. And just like that, we're in the air. Aboard our Albatross D3, the Candy Striper, that's what I'm gonna call it. I know, it's not, but whatever. You'll get up you'll get used to it. Uh, this aircraft was used by both the Imperial German Air Army Air Service and the Austro-Hungarian Army uh, Air Service during World War One. It was the preeminent fighter of German uh, during the period of German aerial dominance, known as Bloody April in 1917. Following the successful Albatross D1 and D2 series, the D3 utilized the same semi-monocoque plywood skinned fuselage. However, at the request of Idflag, the D3 adopted a wing arrangement similar to the French Newport 11. The upper wingspan was extended while the lower wing was redesigned, whoa, with reduced cord and single main spar. The V-shaped interplane struts replaced the previous parallel struts. For this reason, British air crews commonly referred to the D3 as the V-strutter. Woo, V-strutter. Now, two faults with the new aircraft were soon identified. Like the D2, early D3s featured a Trevzon Braun airfoil-shaped radiator in the center of the upper wing. Notice we don't have one here. Oh no, we do have one. Uh-oh, this is an early model. That might be problems. <laughs> We're intended to scald the pilots if punctured. That would stink. But, you know, scalding, at least you're still alive. Right? More seriously, the new aircraft immediately became began experiencing failures of the lower wing ribs and leading edge. A defect it shared with the Newport 17. Now, while that lower wing had sufficient strength in static tests, it, subsequent, it was subsequently determined that the main spar was located too far aft, causing the wings to twist under aerodynamic load. Now, when it twists, of course, stuff starts popping off because you, you don't want your wing to twist like that. It's, it's kind of a bad thing. So pilots were told, don't perform steep or prolonged dives in the D3. Yeah. Uh, design flaw persisted despite attempts to rectify the problem in the D3 and in the D5. So they never really fixed it. They just said, don't dive really fast. Okay. I, all right. Whatever. Peak service was November 1917 with 440 air, 446 aircraft on the Western Front. The D3 didn't disappear with the end of production. And it remained a frontline service well into 1918. In fact, as of 31 August 1918, 54 D3s remained on the Western Front. Now, after the armistice, Poland acquired 38 Series 253 aircraft, as well as several OAW machines, and operated them in the Polish-Soviet War of 1919 to 1920. They were primarily employed in ground attack duties. The Poles 
thought so highly of the D3, they sent a letter of commendation to the Oflag factory. Additionally, the newly formed Czechoslovakian Air Force also obtained and operated several machines after the war. So, overall, the thing lasted a lot longer than it expected. Wow, there, would you stop trying to crash the plane, please? I'm trying, man, I'm trying. We're just going to land randomly here. Again, these aircrafts, the old aerodomes, they were just circles of, like, grass, so we can easily land in grass. Uh, crew of one, duh. <laughs> Maximum speed, 175 kilometers an hour, or 109 miles an hour at sea level. Range of 480 kilometers, or 300 miles, and the armament were two 7.92 millimeter LMG 08 stroke 15 machine guns. Alright, let's see if we can just make a nice, a gentle, easy landing here. The plane has a lot of, of behavior. A, an easy flick of the rudder really gets a movement out of the plane, so it's quite good for that. Additionally, because it's a biplane, it's very hesitant to stop flying. This is true of most biplanes, so it's something that you have to uh, definitely take into consideration. Also, there are no brakes in World War I aircraft, by the way. I'm pressing the brake button. There are no wheel brakes. So you uh, kind of have to be careful about that. Now, something I noticed while I was flying here. Look, you can actually see the valves going. Is that not cool? Hopefully we're not going to crash and die while we're just cruising along here. That is pretty darn nice looking to actually see the valves. Let's get in our plane really quick. You can see them in here as well, which is pretty cool. Cockpit, very simple cockpit. Very, very simple, actually. There's your compass down there. There's your only navigational aid. And everything else is pretty much um, basic. You don't get much more basic than a World War One aircraft, honestly. I've moved my throttle to zero, so when the aircraft stops, it's probably going to shut that engine down. Maybe. All right, let's see if there's any numbers on this thing. Shift one, that centers my view. Two, nope, that's it. <laughs> As I would actually expect. Um, I must have been since I warmed it up, it's gonna stay running. Oh, that's good. Very nice looking aircraft, really cool. I mean, fix the propeller thing and it's, it's a keeper. I'll say that much. Fix the propeller thing, it's a keeper. Way back when I did the British uh, SE.5A or something like that. And it was a very nice aircraft as well. This one would be a nice one to have. You know, maybe, oh, do FSX multiplayer. One person has an Albatross. One person has an SE.5A. Uh, SE you guys could have a battle in the air. That'd be pretty cool. Oh, a person disappeared. <laughs> Fix the prop. Oh, my God. Fix the prop. All right, the link to this aircraft is in the description. As always, I've been Derek Tebbers. This has been your Flight Simulator X Plane Spotlight, the Albatross D3. Definitely worth checking out if you uh, like World War One, or if you want to have a multiplayer dogfight over the Western Front. Ah, oh, someone needs to do that and record it. Maybe I will. Hey, Shadowbox, let's, let's have a fight. <laughs>